Welcome to our lecture on the origins and classifications of languages. Uh, the slides are designed to accompany the textbook People, Places, and Culture, and I am of course Ms. Gall and I'll be your host for the lecture. So just to give you some idea of what we're talking about when we talk about languages and where they come from and how they've spread and things like that, just to give you kind of the general idea, right? So we've got our, say, our Indo-European languages, and those are in the yellow, Afro-Asiatic language family, those are in kind of the funky gray-green, um, the Niger-Congo languages in the orange, right? Uh, we've got Saharan, Sudanic, Khoisan, um, also all in Africa. We've got Uralic, Altaic in Asia, right? We've got, or sorry, in not so much in Asia as in uh, really Russia, and, which means it's partially in Asia, but also partially in Europe for a lot of it. Sino-Tibetan, Japanese and Korean are related, Dravidian, yeah, you get the idea. You can look across this and see where do we see speakers of different types of, of languages, right? So, when we talk about um, why are languages distributed the way they are, one of the first things we have to talk about is what, um, how we define languages and then what is some of the debate surrounding that. And the first thing you get to know is that the classification of languages is subject to intense debate. Um, and so most linguists say that there's a few dozen language, or a few language families. Others say that there's dozens of language families. Right, and one of those things you have to know is just like with the last lecture where we were talking about um, isoglosses, right, and how language um, dialects and how dialect regions kind of slide into each other in their vernacular regions, we can draw lines pretty pretty clearly around language speakers, but at the same time when we're talking about those origins and how, how they're distributed and things like that, those definitions are kind of, they slide a little bit. And we talk about what makes, say, Russian different from Polish or Ukrainian. There's some clear things we can point to, but there's a lot of overlap between them. And those are the kinds of things that linguists debate about. So uh, one of the first ways we talk about how our language is formed, right? We talk about sound shift, which is just a slight change in a word across languages or within a subfamily or throughout a language family from the present. And what we can do is we can actually trace that backwards in time towards its origin by tracing those sound shifts. So for example, Italian, Spanish, and French are members of the Romance language family, which means they trace their origins to Latin. And one of the ways that we can tell that is, for example, um, the word they use for eight, and it's, let's see, it's, or the prefix, is I think it's auto in Italian, it's octo in Spanish, and I'm forgetting the French version, but it's very similar. And you can see, even with those two, how they're actually very, very similar, right? So one of the things that linguists do is they try to trace these, trace these sound shifts across space and across time. And in doing that, work backwards in time to determine what was the original language. And so kind of that, when we talk about Indo-European languages, which is Indo-European languages are the most widely spoken language family in the world, um, there's this hypothesis from the studies of this guy, Jakob Grimm, Grimm sorry, and William Jones, that look at it proto, they call it proto-Indo-European, which is like the parent of Indo-European. Um, and what they've done is they've traced those sound shifts and those words across time to try and figure out what was it this language actually sounded like <clears throat> before it started spreading out across Europe and taking on the forms that we know and love today. So one, and doing that working backwards, by the way, we call that um, backwards reconstruction. So they track sound shifts, they track the hardening of consonants, and they try to move it backwards towards that original language. And that original language, of course, is extinct, which is to say it's a language without any native speakers anymore, in part because it's split off into all of these different languages and different language families. Right, and even today, by the way, extinct languages is a problem that's going on even today. There are languages that go extinct on a pretty regular basis. <clears throat> um, we try to do deep reconstruction, right? So we take that backward reconstruction a further step. That's when we start to try to recreate the language that preceded 
a language. So for example, the language that preceded Proto-Indo-European. And a couple of the guys who've been big in working on that are uh, Vladislav Ilyich Svitic and Aaron Dogopolsky, who hypothesize that there's a Nostratic language that actually goes for even further back than Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European, and they've traced that back to try and, and figure out what that was. So if we want to look at, for example, the hearth of Proto-Indo-European, right, and we're not going to go all the way back to Nostratic, <clears throat> but one of the one of the linguists, this guy August Schle uh, Schleicher, I think it probably is, or Schleicher, one of the two, anyways, talks about language divergence. And what you got to know when you talk about things diverging is it just means that they're splitting up. So this is where when we're talking about language, language is diverging. We're talking about a new language being formed from an old one. Okay, so it's splitting up from the old one. Language convergence, on the other hand, is what happens when we collapse two languages into one. And this is what we see happen if, for example, um, when we have a uh, Creole language that gets developed. It's a language that has started out as two languages that then developed an ability to speak to each other, adopting common words from both, that then became its own language, right? Um, and as this divergence and convergence is occurring, what we see is languages being born and died, right? So language extinction happens when all the descendants of a language perish, or they, sorry, when they say all the descendants, all the descendants of speakers perish, or they choose to use another language. And typically this will occur over several generations, right? So for example, if we were talking about Immigrants, immigrants say to the U.S. speak whatever language they spoke at home in their home country. Plus, then they learn to speak English. Oftentimes, their kids speak English better than they speak the language from the home country, but they they still oftentimes speak both because their parents are more comfortable that way. But then, by the third generation, oftentimes those kids don't learn the original language because their parents are more comfortable speaking in English, and so they just bring up their kids in English. Right, so that's what we mean when we say it occurs across several generations. <clears throat> and if we were going to try and theorize where is the hearth of that Proto-Indo-European language, what we would do is place it somewhere in the vicinity of the Black Sea or maybe East Central Europe. <clears throat> so if we're going to look at um, the language tree, which is a great way of, it's a great visual aid to try and help you figure out, <coughs> pardon me, where languages come from and what are the relationships between languages. What we've got here is we're really showing just one small branch of the, and so we're showing the Indo-European language tree, right? And at the very bottom there, the main branch, that's Proto-Indo-European, and then we've got it split off into these other languages, which then split off into still others. And finally, out at the ends, we get the languages that we speak today, right? So, for example, with with the Celtic branch, that's where we get, you know, Irish and Scottish as part of the, the Gaulish languages. We get Welsh and Breton and Cornish as part of the Britannic languages, <clears throat> right? We get Romanian, Spanish, Italian, French as part of the Latin languages, and you get the idea. <clears throat> so, when we're talking about tracing the routes of diffusion of these of Proto-Indo-European, one of the commonalities among that language diffusion theories is a focus on Europe, <coughs> which makes sense since most of the speakers live in, in Europe, right? It's clear as we do this that the language diffused into Europe across time, and we've got a significant body of historical and archaeological research that focuses on that early peopling of Europe, and that's how we know that that developed across time. We're able to trace that development using that archaeology, using those historical documents and the like. Um, there's really two major theories, by the way, that talk about how um, Proto-Indo-European diffused into Europe. And so uh, we've got the conquest theory, which is to say that it spread from east to west over on horseback, uh, as new inhabitants overpowered earlier inhabitants and began um, diffusing and ultimately differentiating those Indo-European tongues as those um, conquerors spread out across Europe. 
right? An alternative theory to that, by the way, uh, which is not violent. So the conquest theory focuses basically on spread through warfare, but an alternative theory proposes that it actually spread westward through Europe with the diffusion of agriculture and agricultural techniques. So that's obviously a much more peaceful way of uh, doing it. <clears throat> and then another kind of hypothesis to go with this focuses on how uh, the Proto-Indo-European language was first carried eastward to Southwest Asia. Okay, so that's um, really today we call that the Middle East, right? Next kind of around the Caspian Sea, so that's right around Turkey thereabouts, and then across the Russian-Ukrainian plains and on into the Balkans and then down into Europe <clears throat> from there. And these are just some maps to give you a little bit of an idea of how that, that might have worked. So for example, if we're talking about the proposed westward dispersal roughly through content, you can see on the map on the left, on the bottom right hand corner, we've got our hearth in Anatolia, which places it right around modern Turkey. And it kind of spreads out from there, down through Greece, and then across parts of the Mediterranean and out and up. And then if we look at the dispersal hypothesis, which is the one on the right, it's a little bit different. It's that we start in not quite the same area, right? So instead of starting in Turkey, we're starting a little further um, south and going from kind of the Caucasus Mountains around the Caspian Sea up and then through and down into to Europe from there. So this has been our lecture talking about the um, origins and dispersals of, of di sorry, origin and diffusion of language. Talked a lot, a lot of the big focus on Indo-European and the Indo-European language family and specifically Proto-Indo-European and how that language kind of spread out and where it may have come from and also how we reconstruct what that language is. Um, what we didn't do was look at very look at specific languages other than to talk a little bit about sound shift and how that works and how we can use that then to trace the origins of these languages. So if you have questions, I'd be delighted to do what I can with them. Uh, please feel free to bring them into class and I will see you the next time we meet.